keep... Oh, sorry about that. Today, math, 24-13. Day 28. 5-0-3-2-3. This is the last day of the semester. Yeah, it's really, exactly. It's really the first week of May. I know, it flies way too quick. So today, we're going to, instead of going through step by step by step, going through everything in Chapter 5, because it's the last day, I want to get to the important points. Because to in this chapter, the whole purpose of calculus is introduced. The fundamental theorem of calculus is defined here. And, and we're going to try to cram it in one day. But I'm not, I'm not going to spend more time on the, on the long drawn out stuff like, like the limits and things. We'll talk about that where it came from, but then we'll get to the formulas, the, the procedures for finding the integrals, we'll just practice on those. And that's what the fundamental theorem of calculus is all about. To begin with, what was the purpose of calculus? Why was it such a, back in the 1500s, 1600s, it was the hot topic. Why? What was so special about it? But you can't apply something unless you have it, unless you know what it does. Yes, they, they, some of the things you can use it for is for the basic physics of trajectories of cannonballs and any sort of ballista. But what the whole thing was focused on was commerce. How much cargo can you put in a ship? Why is that important? Well, the more, you, more stuff you can cram in a ship, the more money you can make. Remember, unlike Amazon, how did they pack things up to ship about that when back in the 1500s? Or before that even? Do they have boxes to send things in? No. They just wrap things up in, in blankets and stuff. So you have non-standard shape and size cargo that you have to put in a boat and try to sail it. A lot of stuff is breakable. So the car, the captain of the ship figure out, trying to figure out how do I maximize my profit by figuring out how much stuff I can take. Which is what this is all about. In calculus, the first derivative, going what we've been doing, integral calculus, that's figuring out rates of change. Figure out how fast something's going, how fast it's accelerating the, and changing positions, or how fast it's dropping. That's the first half. Now we're going backwards. Antiderivatives, integrals. Here we're going to figure out areas under curves. Because if you know the area of a curve, that's only two dimensional. Now, if you rotate it on the z axis, you now have the volume of the object. So once you know the volume of the object, you know exactly how much space that thing takes. That's where we are today. Section three. The definite integral. 
Again, integrals are, we'll, we'll discover in this chapter that we're going backwards in math. And you go backwards, that's where the term anti comes in. It's an antiderivative. It's going backwards. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the derivative. You tell me the function it came from. All right, so, and for all of these, our functions have to be continuous and, uh, what do you call it, a continuous and uh, differentiable. In other words, each point has to exist on, on the function. All right, so first thing we have to do is a definition of uh, the definite integral. f of x is a continuous function on the closed interval AB. J is a number that is the definite integral of f of x over the closed interval a, b. And j is also the limit The Riemann sums, Riemann, R E I R I E, Riemann. What's Riemann? It's the person's name. Riemann. I think it's Grigor. Grigor's cancer. Is, is a German mathematician back in the 1500s, 1600s. He said this. The reason it's called a sum, here's a Riemann sum. The summation as k goes from 1 to, to n of a function where at a value c times delta x sub k. I'll describe what this is in a second. Limit of the run some sort of this is important. If the limit exists And the following conditions exist. Did limits back in chapter two? Remember that? Well, it's pretty much the same thing here, except instead of this limit formula, we're using the Riemann sum. And again, I'll define what that is in a second. Minus j is less than some value epsilon. What the Riemann sum does is this. Remember, remember what we did last time? I asked you to find the area under this curve. And so we had 
the inscribed, the, the circumscribed, and the medium points to find the areas of these rectangles under the curve. That's what this is. You have a function and at certain values C, which could be the midpoints, could be the upper bound or the lower bound of each interval. These are all your C sub Ks. Delta XK, Delta XK means what? It means the width of each of these rectangles. Delta X is made up of X sub I minus X I minus 1. We have a whole series of these. Remember, we're looking for the area under the curve. Since we found the area of each of these rectangles, how do we find the area of the curve? Let me find Let's pretend we had a rectangle from zero to one. You want to know what the area is of that rectangle. So you found the areas of these three smaller areas. How would you find the area of the entire box? Add them up. The area then would be the first area, the second area, and the third area. Each of those rectangles, you add them up. That would give you the complete area of the box. We do the same thing here. Now remember, with Nonlinear functions, whenever we have curves, the rectangles are not exact. We're going to have some area that's wasted and some areas not counted. So, our objective is to make our delta x get very, 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 very small. If you do that, that means each of these boxes becomes very, 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 very thin. And you have to add up all those which is why we have the summation. The n tells us how many rectangles do we have. Here we had three, so it would be summation of one to three. The width is the delta xk, x of k. The height is the value of that function. And you're right, that is the area based on type. But when it comes to curves, we now have a much more difficult problem with it. And we, we learned last time that the most accurate method would be the midpoint method. On the midpoint of each interval, you use that as your input to the function, that tells you the height of the function. It's still going to have the same width. So some of the graph will be wasted. If we look over here, if here's the midpoint, So some of this is going to be excess, but yet some of it is going to be omitted. But that difference, that variance of area is a lot more negligible than the other two methods. So that's what we're doing. That's what this says. So the summation of all our boxes, all our rectangles, minus the true area of this object is going to give us some number less than epsilon. And instead of doing each of these boxes, which I was going to do originally, basically what we're getting to here is we're going to take this Riemann sum and convert it to what's called the integral. 
you always start off the lower bound is A, upper bound is B. So to find the true area of this curve, we would take the integral from A to B. Always start at the lower, then go to the upper bound. And you have your function. Remember, it's still base times height. The f of x is your height. Delta x is your base. It's your width of each box. So that's what we're going to have to define. That b is your upper bound, uh, upper limit function. A is your lower limit. Remember, in each of your curves, your starting point is A and your ending point is B. So the area under this curve has to be between the the value has to be between the, the value of the higher and lower ends. And this is your function, and this is your integral, your, what your x is varied over. That's what we have to do. And later on, we're going to have a definition for this. This symbol... was introduced by a guy named Gottfried von Leibniz. In the old days, there was a competition between Sir Isaac Newton and Leibniz, Gottfried von Leibniz, to whoever can come up with the, the theory of calculus first would become famous. We use all of Leibniz's symbols. He actually invented it a year before uh, Newton did. But since he lived in near Romania or that part of the world, and you had to get your information to the College of Science, or the Academy of Science in London, it was no problem. Here's London. Newton lived in England, which is it's a three-hour train ride from anywhere. But... Leibniz had to cross the sea, the, 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 the strait, the Bering Strait, not the Bering Strait, but the, uh, anyway, between Europe and London, you had the ocean there. He had to first travel across, get a boat, go across, and then from there go to London. So again, it took him almost a year to travel from where he was to go to London to, to drop all this stuff. So we're getting to this thing. Where when we're done with everything, the actual solution we're looking for is that. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we can get to we get the formal definition later on. Put your phone away. Okay, no more phones. Put your phone away. Kai. Yes, you. Because you're always on your phone looking and texting and everything, so... You notice there's a difference between the function notations. This, in essence, whatever your integral is taking of that function is actually your first derivative. After we do this process, what you're going to end up with is the original function that ended up to being that derivative. Okay, we're going to move backwards. In the first three chapters of the course, we went, I gave you the function, we found the derivative. Now I'm going to give you the derivative, you tell me the function it came from.
We have properties here, the rules of integrals. Order of integration. Remember how this is read? So the integral of f of x from a to b over x. It's read the integral of f of x from a to b over x. Now, whenever we think of integral, the the way you position these bounds, because yeah, remember these are on closed intervals, lower and the upper bound. If you were to reverse these, actually has to take the opposite of it. It becomes the negative of it. So if you have your domain, A and B represent the x values, the width of the object you're looking at. Zero width integral. What if we went from A to A? If the width is zero, what's the area? Zero. Yeah. It's just base times width. If the width is zero, base times zero is zero, so you're done. The constant multiple property. A to B, we have a constant multiple times f of x dx. What are we always done with constants inside our functions? When we take the limits and everything, what do we always do with those? Take it outside. Because the only thing we're interested in since we're taking the integral with respect to x, that's all we're interested in. We're interested in what values relate to our domain. Sum and difference integrals. If we had two functions, and we're taking the integral of those two functions, we can split those up. So we can take the first one, f of x dx, plus or minus whatever the operation is, the integral of the second one.
the additive property or additive, yeah, how's the property? Of integration. Do you, do you always have to integrate from A to B, the entire domain? Do you always have to do it that way? The answer is no. Because what we could do we could split them up into smaller functions. Smaller uh, Bounds of integration. There's if your domain was from A to B, and it was just the function itself was tricky at some points. You could find a value C somewhere between A and B, and find the area here, and then find the area there, and then add them together. The maximum minimum inequality. They have to exist first. If the function a max and a min on the domain, the closed interval AB, and the minimum of our function times B minus A, remember B minus A are the the bounds of our uh, interval is le are less than or equal to a is to be f of x dx is less than or equal to the max of our function times b minus a. Do the min of f times the b minus a, and the max of f times b minus a. Why do you think we're doing that? What are we looking for? What are integrals looking for? Area under a curve, yeah. So the formula for an area in two-dimensional space is based on height. The minimum of your function is the height. That's the y value vertically. Times b minus a, that's the width, the difference between your x axis. So you have the, the height times the base, and here the maximum. It's the how high? It's the highest it can go times the width. Integral, we know that's what it was looking for. So that's, we have to always consider our values, our functions, as being the area of what we're looking for. That's horrible.
This is the comparison. If we have two functions, if f of g is greater than or equal to g of x, f x is less than greater than g of x. Remember, these are all on our closed interval a b. Then the integral of f of x dx is going to be greater than the integral of g of x dx. Why is that? Why is this true? I mean, it's implied that it's true. I'm not going to give you proof. Because if the function f is bigger than g, f is the height of the object itself. So if the height of f of x is taller than the height of g of x, they're both going to have the same delta x. <coughs> Bless you. So because f of x is higher than g of x, the area is greater. And that's what this thing says. Conversely, if f of x is less than or equal to g of x on the closed interval a, b, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is going to be less than or equal to integral from a to b of g of x d of x. Some examples for you. Example one. Uh, let me. Let's say the integral from negative one to one of f of x is five. From 1 to 4 is negative 2. And from negative 1 to 1 of h of x dx is 7. Here are your questions. The integral from 4 to 1 of f of x dx equals what? The answer. Why is it 2? Yeah, because the the bounds, the lower and upper bounds, have switched. Here in the given section, it goes from 1 to 4. Now this one goes from 4 to 1. So because I, I change the order of integration, I change the sign. How about from this one? Negative 1 to 1. 2 times f of x plus... 3 times h of x dx. Hmm? 31. Yeah. Okay. You have the sum of two functions, right? So what do you do? Separate them. You have two f of x dx plus integral from negative one to one of three h of x dx. They have constant coefficients. 
so they can be factored out. So it's 2 times the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x dx plus 3 the integral of negative from negative 1 to 1 of h of x dx negative 1 to 1 f of x is 5 Negative 1 to 1 of h of x is 7. 10 plus 21 is 31. Very good. We have one more. And the third one. Integral from negative 1 to 4 of f of x dx So what do you think you do here? Do we have anything go from negative 1 to 4? Yep. According to your givens, f of x goes from negative 1 to 1, and that one equaled 5. And then f of x went from 1 to 4. That equals negative 2. So, since we don't have both the entire list from negative 1 to 4, we have to break it up into both of these parts. So we go from negative 1 to 1, and then we have to add the next one from 1 to 4. If we add these together, this one goes from negative 1 to 1, 1 to 4. Then if we add them together, we're going from negative 1 to 4. This first one is 5. The next one is negative 2. Add them together, you get 3. The area is 3 whatevers. Show that the value of zero to one of one plus cosine x dx is less than or equal to Radical 2. So what are we asked to find here? So this is the value of the integral from, from 0 to 1 of cosine of radical 1 plus cosine is less than or equal to radical 2.
So what we have to find is that. But that's, what, that's just what the question says. The stuff we have to do has to go between there. Our proof has to go between here. So how do we do that? No. Good thinking, though, but no. We have an ellipse on because we have to first figure out what the area was first. We're just asked, it's given to us, everybody's saying it's, it's radical too. We just have to find and say, show that this value is between those ends. Again, we're trying to find the area, right? So what would be the area function with the information that's given to us in the question? What's our height? What's the... And what does that equal? No, no. What does that equal? So we have the radical 2. That's our height. What's our width? Our width are the x values. What x values are we using? These represent your x values. Remember, on a graph, your upper and lower bound of your integral function comes from the x-axis. It comes from the higher and lower values of your domain or your subdomain. So the higher is 1 minus 0. Here's your y value, because that's the height. Here are your x values. So what, we're, what we have to do now is figure out 1 minus 0 is 1 times radical 2 is radical 2. Is this true? Yes. They're equal. So then, therefore, this integral has to be less than or equal to radical 2. Simply because of the way that the function is set up. Any questions about that? Here's another example. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go, yeah. Yes, no, no worries. Yes, me too. Compute the integral from 0 to b of x dx and find the area A under the curve Y equals X over the integral or interval, not interval, interval of 0b, where b is positive. Got to be a closed interval.
We know from our last example between the integral less than or equal to radical 2. The way we set that up So, what has to be true for, does it have a constant? Yes, it's a 1. We know that our C is 1. What is that equal to? We know it's going to be true because whatever we, the bounds are, we'll get that. What? Group is X, not C. What? Does X or F have to be if the derivative is X? If the derivative of x, if there's the derivative of x is 1, yes, if I gave you the integral of 1, you say it has to be x. And we're going to talk about those if we have time today. It would be the const, uh, x plus some constant. Because when we take a derivative, so for example, the derivative of x plus the constant. would be simply 1 plus 0. It would just be 1. So when we're going backwards, we have to consider what the constant is. That's why we're doing this first. We know now our c is 1. So, if the first derivative of x, what is the original function? Work backwards. I'm, I'm taking a big jump here. Remember when we, when we did our derivatives using, using the power rule? What's the derivative of x to the power n? n times x, n minus 1. Take the power down and you subtract it from the exponent. So that's what we have here. Our derivative is 1x to the power 1. How do we go from here to there? Look at the exponent. What do we do to the exponent to get from here to there? You have to add 1. So we have to add 1. Remember, this is what n is going to be. So what we're looking for is so far we have the x correct. If you take the derivative of x squared, that 2 comes down here, right? But it disappears. It's no longer there. What would have to happen for this to disappear? So think of this way. If we had that, in order to make this n disappear, I've got to divide by n.
So the derivative of this one, leave the bottom, it's constant. So bring down the 2, subtract 1, those cancel. And that's what I have. So the integral of my equation is it has to be x squared over 2 plus c. That's the function it came from. And we know that c is 1 because of this rule we look at there. cx equals that. So c is 1. So we know our equation is x squared over 2 plus 1. has to be from B. Yeah, I'm here. I'm taking another quick leap for y'all. Let me instruct you what happens here. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus. I hold off here. We're going to show you the fundamental theorem of calculus. Once you find the integral of f of x, dx, Let's say that equals some, that some function f, capital F, because it's not the same as this one. Remember, this one here is a derivative. This one here is a, the antiderivative. Since I'm finished with the integral, my bounds are from A to B. So what this thing says is this. For me to find the area under the curve, the, this function, I start off with the highest bound minus the function at the lower bound. And there you have the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's what the whole battle is about. Let's look at some properties here. So the integral of a constant remember there's no x what is the value of the x function the derivative it can't be the constant because the constant can be taken out here There's a 1 right here. So if the derivative if the derivative gives you a 1, what was the original function then? The C that? Once we found the antiderivative, the constant. Now, since we're looking at x's, we take for x value from b to a. So it's going to be b minus a. And it's always, always, always going to be that way. Once you find the interval, then start off the top point, plug in your function, then minus the bottom point in that function. That's what it looks like. So the Integral of a constant is a constant times the bounds.
We just did this one. If the derivative of x is x, where did it come from? So you start off at B minus the value at A. But this is the important part right here. How about if we ended up with X squared? Mm -hmm. It becomes b cubed over 3 minus a cubed over 3. That will give you the true answer. So the formulas... But without, without the bounds. The integral of a constant is that constant. Well, let's make another one. The reason, because yes, we know the integral of constant is that constant times the value x. You get the derivative of x, it becomes 1, and then you have a constant. We think each one of these has to have a, a constant value. In other words, if I gave you 2x plus 3, that's my function, what's the derivative? So there. So if I had, if I if I inter took the integral of two, what had to be true? The integral of two means that two had to have an x value plus something else, some other constant, and that's what this thing says. The integral of x dx. That one came from x squared over 2 plus c. And the integral of x squared dx, it came from x cubed over 3. So is there a pattern forming here? What would be the general formula for x to some power n, if that's my derivative? The integral of x to the power n dx would simply be x to the power n plus 1, because you have to add 1 to the power, and because that becomes the coefficient, you have to divide by it, plus some constant. And there's your general formula for it. Notice that I don't have any a's or b's in my integrals. These are indefinite integrals.
Definite integrals go from A to B. It's, it's within some closed interval. How would you find the average area under a curve? Average area under a curve. So it would be the area divided by B minus A. Part over total. So what is the area? The area is the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So this is how you would find the average area under a curve. Find the average value of f of x equals radical 4 minus x squared on the closed interval negative 2, 2. First off, what does that value, the, the function, represent? It is, but what is the original equation? I mean, look at that function here. <coughs> what else? This is the original function. We haven't talked about a derivative uh, integral yet. What is this defining? That's you. It has to relate to this. Four is made up of two squared. So wouldn't it give us this? or something similar to it. It's not this, because it's a minus between there. In the Pythagorean theorem, the A represents the horizontal axis, the B is the vertical axis, and the C is whatever axis you're looking at, or is the hypotenuse. Since we have a minus,
we have is, since there's no plus or minus in front of that one, that means we're dealing with half a circle. Yes, the Pythagorean theorem is, besides defining right triangles, the sides of the legs of right triangles, it also defines the equation of a circle. First C is the radius. So our picture Since we have two there, that's our radius. Since we don't have the minus sign, we don't care about the bottom part. So the area of a circle is what? What's the area formula for area of a circle? Squared. That's a whole circle. We only want a half of that. So the formula we're going to be using for our half circle is pi r squared divided by 2. What's the radius? From 0 to 2 is 2. So r equals 2. I 2 squared over 2. So we know the area we're interested in is 2 pi. So that's the maximum it could be. So, our function, the average of it, after we take all the rectangles, the average of all those should be less than or equal to the area we just calculated, which is 2 pi. What is A, what is B in our equation? What are our, what's our closed interval? Negative 2 to 2. So our A and B are from negative 2 to 2. minus negative 2, the integral from negative 2 to 2, 4 minus x squared dx has to be, since we calculated it, it has to be equal to 2 pi. Because the, the overall has to be there. But since we have a curve, we have to take the average of it. Negative, negative makes it positive, so it's 1 over 4.
multiply both sides by 4. Whatever our integral is, that equals 8 pi. We haven't talked about how to uh, integrate those kind of problems. We're not going to go any further with it. Let's look at some examples. Let's practice doing our integration because we already have time. Equal size here. Here's some examples. From A to X. E cubed plus one dt. I'll put all four of them up there. One, two would be x to five, three t, nine t dt. From 1 to x squared, cosine t dt, 1 plus 3 x squared, 4, 1 over 2 plus e to the power t dt, I figure these out. The fundamental theorem of calculus one. F of X continuous on the closed interval. A, B. So if f of x is continuous on a closed interval A, B, then f prime of x is equal to the integral of A to B of f of x dx. And f, f, f prime of x dx is, is that. And it's continuous because it's a differentiable function. A, B. And differentiable. The open interval.
that its derivative is f of x. It brings us f prime of x is equal to the integral or the derivative of the integral. f prime of x is equal to the derivative of the integral from a to x of f of t dt equals f of x. So the derivative of x is equal to the derivative of the integral. Remember, the integral finds the original function of that derivative, but the derivative of the integral is the function itself, right? That's what this one's saying. The only thing different is we're differentiating with respect to t, and then it becomes an x, because that's all we have in our function. In our first one, what it's asking for is the derivative of this function integrable over x dx. That's the answer. The derivative of the integral is simply the function itself. Think of this again. The derivative of the integral is simply the function itself. Since we're looking at x, which on the bottom, what do we got to do to it? Yes. So what we have to do with this one, uh, I wish I had more room. I was running out of paper. I don't... Number two. Three t sine t dt and when we switch the points of integration we gotta change the sign so then all you have to do is replace the t with x there's a, I'm sorry there's that answer Question three. One to x squared cosine t dt so can we just plug it in and go? And that equals what? Because remember, what's the derivative of cosine 2x? If 
uh, turns out I explain what I mean. It's a product rule or a chain rule. Cosine u. Remember, we're taking the derivative of it. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine u u. So the derivative of that, that's my u, my du would be 2x. Cosine x squared. Remember, since we're converting it from cosine t dt, all we have to do is take the derivative of our internal function. <coughs> <coughs> and the last one, 1 plus 3x squared goes to 4 of 1 over 2 plus e to the power t dt. What's the first thing we have to do? The x has to be on top for us to be able to integrate it. Remember, we're looking at the derivative. So we set the derivative of this to see if anything goes on top. So what we would have had, we'd have 2 plus e to the power t to the power negative 1. The derivative of this would give us what? the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside, which is e to the power t. Okay. The only thing different here be that. negative e to the t plus e t negative 
2 plus e to the power plus 3 squared, 3 x squared. Top would become squared the derivative is a function itself that must be I'm not sure about. Okay. Let's look at some trick functions. Um, first off, this is the second half of the fundamental theory of calculus, the one I told you earlier. <laughs> From 0 to pi of cosine x dx. What's the integral of cosine x dx? In other words, what function gave us a derivative of cosine? Sine. From 0 to pi. The way you could test it, take a derivative of sine, is it cosine? Yes. So that's true, and that's a derivative. So now we'll take the top function, so it's sine of pi minus sine of zero. What's sine of pi? Zero. Sine of zero is zero. The answer is zero. The integral from negative pi over 4 to 0 of secant x tangent x dx So look at your notes. What function gave us the derivative of secant tangent? Remember, I asked you to put together a sheet, a formula sheet for that. I, I'm still going to send it to you all. What function started off that when we took a derivative gave us the, the derivative of secant tangent? Secant. Very good. Try it. Secant, the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So we take it from 0 to negative pi over 4, which becomes secant of 0 minus the secant of negative pi over 4. Secant is 1 over cosine, so cosine at 0 is what? 1, so it's 1 over 1, so this part's 1 minus 1 over cosine of negative pi over 4. Negative pi over 4 
would make it what well, would be two pi minus pi over four. 8 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4. So what would that give us? What's the cosine of pi over 4? It's going to be positive because cosine deals with the x-axis. So what's the cosine of pi over 4, positive pi over 4? Yeah. And there we have it. Third one, integral from 1 to 4 of 3 over 2 radical x minus 4 over x squared dx. We'll just put those up. You can take out the constant. This one becomes x to the power negative 2. Radical x is x to the power 1 half. Power negative 2. Remember the shortcut. Whenever you have integral of x to the power n, it will be x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. So we have to add 1 to the exponent up here, and it's the same thing up there will be on the bottom. x to the power 3 over 2 over 3 over 2, from 1 to 4. Integral of this one is negative 1 over negative 1, 1 to 4. Remember, we're adding 1, so it's negative 2 plus 1 on the bottom. 3 over 2, this flips, so it's 2 over 3, x to the power 3 halves from 1 to 4. Negatives cancel, so it's positive 4. x to the power of negative 1 from 1 to 4. Coefficients cancel. x to the power of 3 over 2 plus 4x to the power of negative 1. Let's see this first part. So we have 4 to the power 3 over 2 minus 1 to the power 3 over 2. These are my x values. 
you got the four, so it's four to the power of negative one minus one to the power of negative one. So this one could be taken as one third or one half to the power of three. One half to the power of three. One over four minus one over one. So the power of one half is the square root. The square root of four is two to the power of three. One to any power to one, so it's one. I can distribute, so the fours cancel, so I just have one minus four. Two to the third is eight, two times two times two, minus one, plus one minus four, seven plus negative three is four. Went through each step for y'all there. All algebraic. Let's see what the next question is going to be. Any questions about that one? Besides what I just do. What did I do? Okay, that's. Okay, these. Let me. I want to do one more. Oh well. What I did. I'll slow down. Because it's a plus or minus. I can take the integral of both parts separately. Constant numbers I took out to the front. need to have exponents. So I rewrote the first one. Radical x is the same thing as x to the power of one half. This is really exponent, but it's on the bottom, so I moved it up, made it to a negative exponent. The rule here is when you're integrating powers, add one to the exponent, and whatever that is, put it in the denominator. Add, add one to the top, and whatever is on top, I put it on the bottom. One half plus one, or two over two, makes it three over two, over three over two. And it's from the, the bounds of my, once, once you take the integral of it, you have to take it to the bounds. Add one to the top. So negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1 over negative 1.
And from here, all I did was start off with the top number. That, that becomes 2 over 3. It flips on the bottom. So I take 4 to the power of 3 halves minus the bottom, 1 to the power of 3 halves. Four to the power of negative one over negative one minus one to the power of negative one over negative one. These cancel. This negative changes that to positive. Negative x power negative 1. 1, because 1 anywhere is 1. Negative negative is a positive. Negative positive is a negative. Or, if the exponent is on the bottom, so if the bottom number is a 2, we know it's a square root. So the square root of 4 is 2 to the power of 3 makes it 8. 1 is itself. Minus 1. This one was 4, no, actually it's 4. Four to the power of negative 1 is 4 over 4. That makes it 1. So it's 1 minus 4 makes it negative 3. 7 minus 3 is 4. But that, it's all algebra. Once you get started, it's all algebra. And they only get more difficult from there. One last question. Tell me the derivative or the integral of this function. Tell me the integral of that one. This will be your exit ticket for the day. Go to me and you can leave. Thank you all very, very, for a wonderful semester. Thank you all very, very much. I'm sorry if I was scatterbrained most of the time, but thank you.